Hi, Filmatics. Welcome back for part two with Stephen David Brooks. Uh, Stephen David Brooks is a writer, director, and recovering VFX supervisor. I'm so dyslexic, so I hope I said that right. VFX. And his. Yeah, uh, visual, visual effects. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And um, you, you are known for Heads and Tails and Fly Trap and the Grammy shortlisted music video, Deal Me In, and also the uh, the video for Little Steven's Coolest Song in the World by Tearaways, Charlie, Keith, and Ringo, featuring Blondie drummer Clem Burke. Is that Ringo's star that was on there? Yes. Oh my gosh, it's OMG. A, it, <laughs> it's a song, it's in honor of their great drummer, the Tearaways wrote a song called Charlie, Keith, and Ringo, who were three drummers who influenced Clem. Charlie Watts of the Stones, Ringo Starr, obviously, of the Beatles, and Keith Moon of The Who. Oh my gosh, holy cow. And you have the the drummer from Blondie. Like, and we have so much to talk about. That's why we have part two. Thank you, Phil Maddox, for coming back to part two. Because in part one, if you listen to it, if you haven't listened to it, please listen to Stephen's part one because he uh, has his story with De Betty Davis. And guess who hung out with Betty Davis having cocktails? Uh, hello, Stephen, can you tell them who did? Uh, me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, um, and underage me. <laughs> Were you at legal age drinking with Miss uh, <laughs> Miss Davis? <laughs> well, she would have talked the police out of arresting me. It was fine. <laughs> so, what was your cocktail? What did she fix? Did you fix the cocktail, or did she? Or oh no no she I forget what she drank. It was something very. It was scotch or bourbon or I don't know what it was. Something brown in a glass of ice. I really I don't remember. It was she drank way more than than I did. And and what was your what was your drink? Did she make you a cocktail for you? Yes. And I would just sip it because I can't drink hard liquor. Oh, was it shaken <laughs> or stirred, darling? Darling, would you like yeah. it shaken or stirred? <laughs> Did she say darling? Like what? Uh, was she just cool? Like she was just. You know? uh, she, she was very direct. Um, she actually, when uh, to sort of pick up the end of the story, when I went to see her the my last day of working at the Lance office. I asked her for advice, someone just starting out in the movie business, and she thought about it for a moment, and she told me three things. Um, the first thing was, she said, don't let them underpay you. If they pay you a lot of money, they'll think you're worth it, which I thought was brilliant. Mm. Then she said, then she said, it's okay to be difficult. And she rolled her eyes and said, no, you don't have to be as difficult as I was. Because, you know, she used to terrorize Jack Warner. In fact, she told me that she had already picked out her cemetery plot at Forest Lawn overlooking Warner Brothers so she can keep an eye on Jack Warner's studio. <laughs> and the third bit of advice to this day, I can't remember. And I just have this sense I'll remember it when I need to remember it. Oh, beautiful. And then also she gave you a gift from my favorite director. You guys all know by now I was born in Italy. My mom is in Italy. I just missed her call. Ciao, mama. Uh, you got the ashtray from Fellini, the director Fellini, who she yes. he gave it to Betty, Betty Davis. And she gave it to you to like wish you like basically good luck. You're going to do well as a director. Exactly. Writer. And you yep. did. You did. And um, that's such an amazing story. And oh, people off, off camera, he told me a story. I'm just still laughing, but we can't we can't share that one. But <laughs> I have a visual in my head. <laughs> so anyhow, I just had to like, okay, so we'll get back. So Stephen, so uh, when um, because this is part two, so some people might just be listening to part two, but I just want to just let them know that you worked for legendary, legendary. It's uh, what's what's his name? It was Rob Robbie Lance, right? Or yes. Yes, right. legendary agent Robbie Lance. Yeah, who just had everybody, like from directors to actors. He had Rachel Raquel Welsh and the British, the British actor. What was his name again? That gave you hundred dollar bills for because he was such a gentleman and charming. Oh, R Roy Dotrice. Yeah, and then oh, since you're a guy, like I mean, like I, I'm, so, I'm traditional talk because I'm older than most of the people listening to new newbies. So I still, you know, that's still my vocabulary. Um, what was it like to see Raquel Welsh walk into the room? Was it just like bam? Uh, well, it actually was more than just walk into the room. I because when Robbie Lance came to town, he was in the worked in New York. His office was in New York. When he came to the LA office, 
I would drive him around town and I drove him up to uh, Robert Evans house. Um, that famous house that if you watch the documentary and Robert Evans, the famous house that he had, he lost and then Jack Nicholson bought for him again. Um, and it was for a meeting with Robert Evans and Robert comes out to say hello to Robbie and he was with Raquel Welch. And that was just a very brief, hi, how are you? <laughs> That's all. I, was, hey, I met his son, his son, and he had a car, like a convertible car with red leather seats outside of Sunset Saddle Ranch. So, uh, huh. yeah, I'm really stories. So, okay, so then you went, okay, so after working for legendary Robert um, Vance, then you worked for the visual supervisor company, right? Yes, I worked for Apogee for legendary visual effects supervisor John Dykstra. Um who supervised the effects for Star Wars, won an Oscar, dozens of other movies, won an Oscar for Spider-Man 2, and most recently did the visual effects for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. All those shots of people driving through 1960s Hollywood was all John Dykstra effects. Oh, wow. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Uh, hello? You mean Once Upon... Mr. Quentin Tarantino's film? Yes. Yep. Oh, he, I, I met him and he was so nice to me. He was super nice, super, super nice. And he, of course, two directors, Quentin Tarantino sitting with Paul Thomas Anderson. And, you know, uh, as, oh, my, um, <laughs> my dog is like, <gasps> I have a husky. And, and my friend, who's a director, just picked her up to go with his, uh, with his dog. So she just ripped the cord out of my thing. But yes. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So uh, on part one, we were talking about, um, yeah, your your jump to directing because you were doing second unit second unit um directing and then you were doing the visual effects and you were writing so uh can you share with us um you know before we ran out of time we asked everyone to come back too so your jump to directing your first film that was shooting in south africa and um can you share with us that what well was the no that was that was the mangler the oh. Stephen king film that I that I wrote that was shot in South Africa. No, the, my first film was a director, Heads and Tails, shot in LA. Oh, okay, okay. So that's that's the film, Heads and Tails. Okay, so now we're <laughs> yes. but but in the, the key, one keynote. Yeah, the recap the recap is it was a five million dollar script. I was offered twenty thousand dollars, a camera and ninety thousand feet of film um to do it. And I said yes and I wrote that script down to a twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar movie. Uh, shot it, started shooting, the, the financing never came through, so I put it on credit cards and was cashing credit card, cash advance checks to pay the crew. I was running to the bank at lunchtime and that kind of thing, because everybody got paid. I never had everybody, anybody work for nothing. Um, made the film. Uh, uh, first film festival I got in, Dances with Films, I won the Audience Award. And uh, onward from there. That's amazing. So, uh, Stephen, so then can you share with us your, um, then your, so you won the audience award. So what was it like? You had a, a investor that was supposed to give you the money. You went from 5 million to what was the budget? It was supposed to be. Uh, it was supposed to be $20,000 plus a free camera and 90,000 feet of film plus process. So that would come out to about 50,000. And then, so you did it yourself after that. So what, then what was it reduced to the budget? Well, it all in, it was about 25 grand oh. on credit cards, on credit cards. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was it like, you're making this film. You're, you're like your first director film that you wrote, right? You wrote it as well. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and so, um, so, and what genre was this? Uh, crime comedy. Crime comedy. And so, and you had like your, your, your friend was Sherry. What was the casting director that you worked with on that one? Well, my, my producer, Scott Putman, uh, now ex-wife was Shana Landsberg, who was a well-known casting director. Most of the actors were friends of mine. I had worked with before as a second unit director and she helped fill in a couple of the, couple of the other roles. Oh, wow. So you did your film and what did any of them go on to be in TV shows or films? Did you like? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, the most prominent is uh, the character who played heads, Kevin Rankin. Um, 
went on to, he was, God, he's, he's in a TV series now called Clips, Clippings, Claws, called Claws. Um, wow. Uh, his most famous role was in the Dallas Buyers Club. Remember, Matthew McConaughey had sort of this sexist, racist friend with a big bushy mustache, his best friend. That's Kevin. Wow, gosh, that is so, that's amazing. Like, you know, you got to like, I tell people, find a director and support them and like be part of his team, be part of his team because you, you, they're going to take off and you, and you know, they like working with people that they worked with. So, so you made your film, you got it in the can and then you, then you, did you get distribution or you just started sending it to film festivals? Um, no, I did get distribution. Congratulations. Um, yeah. And then, so. And then you sent it to film festivals, and which one dances dances with films? Dan dancing with films, which is a pretty big LA festival that at the Man's Chinese in Hollywood. Oh wow! And then you got the best audience award. Amazing! Your first film directing out the gate. And my first festival. And your it first was... festival and a big one in Los yeah. Angeles, like a big meaty yeah. one, like with a lot, you know, clout, you know. And Betty Davis, she had the cocktail intuition that you were to be a director because <laughs> yes. she she yes. motivated she basically told it well why are you working for an agent if you want to direct go direct right yep yep yeah. she was very direct but she was right did she ever direct stuff did she direct films ever or no oh, no just acted you sure she didn't direct the director and directing her scene <laughs> well she had a lot of input to her character and she took acting very seriously but no she wasn't the director yeah, yeah, I love when people really just you know get behind their character and have a great point of view. Because uh, my my little nods, uh, the shorts that I've done, I love it when you know because I've worked with like difficult people and like people that didn't have, didn't seem like they have a clue or cared or even studied their lines. And you're doing all this stuff because like I'm already writing, directing, producing. I found the sets, I found the locations. I'm doing the catering. I got the costumes. You know, I'm doing so much, and I'm on my own script supervisor, my own AD, and you know, it's nice when people like just know what they're doing and have a point of view because you I respect them because it's like, yeah, you're coming to the table and you're you're playing and we're making this thing brilliant together. I respect your opinion. But the other people that just didn't even know their line and were like just not taking it seriously and just not giving anything. And you're just like have so much work to do for it to just try to get a shot they can edit with. So I think there's something respectful. And, you know, but like but when people were just difficult to be difficult that like are more harassment and terrorizing you, that's a different story completely. <laughs> well, well there, I mean, there are two kinds of difficult. Unfortunately, actors, most people don't know the difference between the two. Um, there are actors who are just difficult because they're insecure and they and they just want all the attention. They want the bigger trailer. They want the director to spend most of the time talking to them, that's difficult. Um, there are actors who need to tear a character apart and put it back together and who also test a director. And, and I don't mind that kind of difficult because I will engage the actor and take them through their process to get them to the point where they're in the moment and can do the same. There's a, a famous, um, apocryphal story i don't know if it's true but it's probably true about what marlon brando used to do when he worked with a new director the first day the first shot of his first scene he would do two takes on one take he would try and on one take he wouldn't try he would just phone it in and he'd say that's it i'm not doing it anymore and he would see which take that the director would print if the director printed the one where he tried, he thought he knew the director knew what they were doing, he would try the rest of the movie. If the director printed the one where he phoned it in, he would phone it in for the rest of the movie, figuring, why should I try if the director doesn't know what I'm doing? Wow. Well, wow. Oh, gosh. I, I think it's it's wonderful when it's a collaborative and just everyone's coming to the table and just chipping in and putting in their yes. best effort because then it makes it fun. And then you want to work with them again and, and like again and again and again. And like the audience will go, wow, that's just so amazing. And it's so difficult, especially for independent um, short, whether you're doing a short film or a feature film, when you're an indie filmmaker or anyone doing a budget under like a million or less it's just difficult you know so if everyone could come together and pitch in and push in 
then everyone yeah. I think will win at the end because you're making something that's going to be brilliant and like amazing on camera. And, and, you know, like you said, like Clouseau, he just, he, he wasn't the star, but he became the star because he, he showed up with brilliance, brilliance, you know, <clears throat> and, and the director's like, I want more of that. And so he came to the table and he, he got all the cookies and his Easter basket was just full because he brought so much. So I love that story too. So you did this film. It was kind of terrorizing. You were like making it on credit card because your investor called you after how many weeks were you into the shoot when the investor finally showed up and called it, you? It, it was a two week shoot at the end of the first week he called. And you're like, by this point, I don't need you anymore. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're like, okay. So did you end up working with that investor for the next one or no, don't call us. We'll call you. No, nope. That was, that was the last time I ever heard from them. <laughs> so, so did, so did now, how did you do your second film? Did you get uh, like, what happened? What was the steps for your second film? Well, uh, another funny story and talk about once again, how luck, luck meets preparation, I think is, is my mantra for show business and perseverance. So I, after Heads and Tails, uh, everyone who assumes you make an indie movie, win some film festivals, the doors are going to open. People are going to be throwing money at you and you make another movie. Well, uh, five, six years went by after Heads and Tails, or more, or I was saying 10 years. That didn't happen. Had some offers, things fell through. I mean, there's always something on the horizon, but to get something actually across the finish line is difficult. So I thought I need to just shoot something. So I wrote a short called Binky for two of my actors from Heads and Tails, Billy Slaw. Okay, let me let me just see. I think we just lost Stephen because we're recording live. Um, Stephen's coming live from Woodland Hills. He's called in by phone, and let me just see. So Dollars. Oh wait, Stephen, we lost you a little bit. So you did this short with Binky from your two, oh. two actors from your first film. It's, it's right? called, yeah, yeah, from Heads and Tails. I the short called Binky, eight minute short with Billy Sly Williams and Lucy Jenner from Heads and Tails. Shot it in Billy's garage. Um, for 200 bucks because I rented a lens that cost $200 and finished it and played dances with films, played a bunch of other festivals and was in New York screening it at a festival. And I happened to meet a, a lawyer I know there for a beer. He's not an entertainment lawyer, just some, a friend in New York. And out of the blue, he says to me, do you know a producer named so-and-so? And I forget the guy's name. I said, no, why? He goes, well, he wants my buddy to invest $25,000 in a film. Will my buddy get his money back? I said, no, he's going to lose every cent. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend goes, well, what if he invested with you? And I throw in 25000 Could you do something with $50,000? I go, yeah, I could make my movie Flytrap which was budgeted at $15 million. So I wrote it down to $50,000. A month later, I had the money in the bank and we shot between Thanksgiving and Christmas of 2015, 2016. Um, then that film went on. And, and what's interesting is the lead in that film, Jeremy. Wait, 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 we just lost. The the movie shot wait, what, who was the lead in Flytrap, your film? You the lead in Fly Trap is a, a British South African actor named Jeremy Crutchley. Jeremy Crutchley. I met him, Crutchley. I met him in South Africa. He was in The Mangler, and he was a fantastic actor. And I said to him, one day you're going to star in a movie for me. And 25 years later, <laughs> whatever, 20 years later, he did because he moved to L.A. And so we made that movie, won a bunch of awards. Um, you know, and it got distribution, and now I'm working on the next one. Oh, and it's such amazing, Stephen. Like, you're so amazing. Like, you're such so nice and so darn likable. And and the fact that, like... It's an act. It's an act. I'm really not that likable. Uh, <laughs> well... It's uh, my podcast. It's my podcast persona. It's your persona. I love it. Well, uh, so... And, and your films, like, you know, your first film won the Audience Award. So you're obviously... 
the um you know that eight millimeter camera that your dad had that you practice on um and your passion your determination also your writing ability because you know you were one of how many writers that stephen king was looking at for his movie i i, I have no idea at yeah. least five at um least there may five. have been more there's probably more but like they had probably every not like not like knocking anyone down because you know everyone's good at what they do but like being the right like cinderella like being the right glass slipper to match what someone's looking for right you just exactly. showed up and you have the talent and then you also like you said sometimes it, it takes luck like just being at the right the, the fact that you're able to meet someone who said hey you know you know let's throw your writing into the hat ring so now what can you share with yeah. us how COVID was for you and then like you know um how COVID was and then what what you're working on uh, well, yeah, I had a, a, a big, well, I never talk about what I'm working on until it's actually funded. So I'm not going to be specific, but okay. I had a big meeting with a couple of very well-known producers in February about my epic fantasy. Um, I won't mention the title because I'm also superstitious about talking about stuff yeah, that hasn't happened yet. That. Um, but had a meeting in end of February and it was going to be a part of a slate of movies. And then March, everything shut down. <laughs> so everything was shut down for like 14 months. It's starting to pick up again, um, slowly coming back together. But it was just sort of a lost almost a year and a half. Did you write at all? Like, what did you do during COVID? Did you write? Were you inspired? Um, I, I didn't write anything new. Um, I did rewrite that script. The secret project. <laughs> I think. And that's something that had bothered me about it. So it's actually much better now. And I spent a lot of time just on pitch decks, lookbooks, you know, that kind of stuff. Which to be it? ready to go once the restrictions were lifted. Yeah, and that's a whole nother meeting, pitch decks. And um, I just had like a, a big meeting, like I had the big uh, VP development of a TV network meeting. I think I bombed it, but the, um, the, the executive was so gracious, so kind, so nice. I think I got anxiety and I was obsessing and like, I just like it turned it into this huge big thing. And, and I basically, I just think I just, you know, self-sabotage myself because I was so happy and then I was just yeah so like pitch decks and like learning how to pitch and talking to executives to make it like clear and concise and short that's a whole different thing is talking to someone and pitching your idea I, like I think like I'm able, yes. to, I'm able to just write and do my work as an artist and then when you have to talk to someone about it I think you know I just maybe I don't know are you good at talking about your ideas and telling them to people or is it like yes no I'm, I'm very good at pitching my my first pitch was after after the Mangler was there was a bidding war between New Line and Miramax for distribution of the Mangler. Um, I met Bob Weinstein, who was just going to start Dimension Films, and uh, and my agent got a pitch meeting with him, and I pitched Bob. My first pitch ever was Bob Weinstein, <laughs> and if you can survive that and get Bob Weinstein to stand up and yell in a positive way, you can pitch anybody. The trick to pitching is you have to pitch something that they're looking for. You could have the greatest romantic comedy in the world if you're pitching Jason Bloom at Bloomhouse. He's not going to care. He wants a horror movie. You got to know who you're pitching and have something tailored for what they want. That's the key to pitching. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, I have kids content, you know, and that's my dream that there'll be TV shows and films because I mean, like number one around the world ranked top 1.5. My dream, my dream, my dream, my dream, you know, directing and producing my kids content with with a home. So that's my dream. But um, I learned so much. And I was, you know, sometimes you meet these people that give you that kind kindness going, oh, you know, they have something, but maybe they need to just have some knowledge they can come back better and stronger because i did read that some people bomb their first pitch and they come back and their second or third pitch gets picked up and uh so yeah so but for you like you're just so amazing and everything so uh, and, and, and steven do you have a forte what you write comedy thriller or are you just you know uh, <clears throat> uh 
Um, you know, it, it, I kind of know all the genres. It's, I just, when an idea hits me, I sort of pick the right genre for it. So, I mean, that's good and it's bad. Um, cause after the mangler, my agent at the time read my new scripts and said, these are not horror. I go, yeah, I know. He goes, well, you're a horror writer. You have to write horror. I go, well, I'm not a horror writer. I'm a writer. You know, so there is something to be said for mastering a genre and just because Hollywood wants to pigeonhole you. Um, I just can't do that. I, you know, I write whatever the story needs to be. The story tells me what the genre should be. Yeah, like um, I, I love screwball comedy. Like I'm a screwball comedy, comedy, and like when you when I, you have a kids podcast, especially they only can hear it uh, like the audio. So I try to make it as fun as possible and make it entertaining. So um, yeah, because so most of my stories are furry animals, cheeky furry animals, and um, they have learning songs and songs. So. So um, I want to ask you, Stephen, like your directing style, do you have a directing style or like um, how do you, you know, like how do you come to a project as a director? You storyboard, obviously, right? You, do you storyboard everything before you? No. You don't No, storyboard? I do not storyboard. You don't? No. If it's a visual effects, if it's a visual effects sequence, you have to storyboard it for budgeting. No, I don't storyboard it because I, I don't, a, a lot of directors will have a shot in mind and stage the action to the shot. I don't do that. I have a, I have a plan. I know how I'm going to shoot a scene, but then I let the actors feel out the space and try to get a sense of movement. And I let, and I, and then once I have the staging, I adjust the shooting plan to the stage. Oh, Cause I think it's artificial to have actors try to be in a shot when they really should be interacting with the other actors. Amazing. So you have your shot list, right? And so you let it like yes. you let the environment yes, of course. speak. You let the environment dictate it. I like how are you with like um the modern uh the modern do you like the green screens? Do you like the drones? Do you like any of that? Or you, you like is how is that, you know? Well, I because I come from visual effects, so I have no fear of visual effects. I've done a lot of you know, I, I'll give you a great example that I did a music video for this band, The Tearaways. Um, I forget what song, <clears throat> but we were at SIR Sound on their rehearsal stage, shooting the band, playing live. And one of the band members couldn't make it that day. So I just said, fine, I'll green screen him in. So we shot the entire music video without that guy. And then I went to a green screen stage with just that guy and I shot him green screen and dropped him into the shot and no one knows that he wasn't really there. I love that. So, I love that. So for visual effects as a tool and because I come, I've learned from the best like John Dykstra, I can visualize the final shot just seeing the pieces to make sure everything's shot properly so that it goes together. So Stephen, we're like uh, we're almost out of time. Two minutes. So um, Fly Trap is streaming everywhere: IMDb, TV, Tubi, Google Play, yep. iTunes, and check out um, uh, Stephen King's. Uh, I mean Stephen 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 David Brooks' um, YouTube channel. Stephen uh, David Brooks will be in the summary. And Stephen, where can they keep up with you and, and find out what you're working on? YouTube, uh, Facebook, social media. Yeah, so well, my YouTube channel is Stephen David Brooks, and my website is stephendavidbrooks.com, and that's pretty much where everything is. Okay, and then so we have a couple minutes to talk about your music video, real quick. We have like literally like uh, less than two minutes. <laughs> if you want to share your awesome music video with the Beatles and everyone, drummer from Blondie. Uh, yeah. The you mean Charlie Keith and Ringo? Yeah. So it was, we were actually shooting a documentary, which I'm still shooting, um, a year and a half ago. The, the band was recording at Village Recorders in Santa Monica, a legendary studio where Fleetwood Mac and Talking Heads and a bunch of other people recorded. Um, and I was shooting the recording session for a documentary about the band, The Tearaways. And uh, COVID hit. And they didn't go back until like two weeks ago to record the second half of the album. So the documentary was on hold. But I had all this footage of Clem playing Charlie, Keith, and Ringo. So we said, let's just do a music video. So, you know, I took clips of 
Keith Moon, Ringo Starr, Charlie Watts. I played with the time, uh, the, the frame rates and so on, reflected them in the glass. So it looks like Clem is playing alongside them. They're playing the drum tracks with him. It's actually on, on my YouTube channel. Just look up Charlie, Keith and Ringo or Google it and you'll see the video. It's pretty cool.